The title of the message is Our Lord's How to Pray, How To. So many times we hear we should do this, we should do that, we should do this, but they don't tell us how to. Yeah, the how to is so important. Well, Jesus gives us a beautiful how to uh, on prayer in this uh, passage of scripture. But before we go to the uh, scripture itself, let's look at Philippians chapter four, which is, was read to you this morning um, uh, by Dan. Um, Philippians chapter four. And these two wonderful verses uh, that are probably some of the best psychology you'll ever find on the planet. Um, everybody's trying to help people feel better, feel better about themselves, get rid of their fears, have a better self-image, um, have peace and all the rest of it, especially the peace thing. Uh, but here we have God's formula. And uh, Paul writes, be anxious for nothing. In nothing be anxious. I mean, that's, that's a tremendous request. Uh, that's hard, uh, easy to say, hard to do. Uh, don't be anxious. Anxiety is, is um, uh, very, very easy to come by. And the thing is that anxiety is, is, is something different from just plain fear. Uh, fear usually has an object. You can have anxiety and not even know what's going on. You just feel anxious. Uh, so I'm sure most of you have experienced that, where you just get uneasy and, uh, and, then, and, you, and your anxiety then starts looking for targets and say, well, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. That's weird how we do that. But, but he, says there, he says that we shouldn't have anxiety. Now, Jesus said the same thing. Uh, he said not to worry. And not to have anxiety. It doesn't mean you don't have a legitimate fear of real danger, but it means don't be afraid when you really shouldn't be afraid. So don't be anxious, upset, uptight. That's what he's saying. Then he says, but, but. So in nothing be anxious, but, but if that's all he said, it would just be more good advice. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, I remember when I was in my first church, we had a little church. It was about the size of the, that's, that part of this church. It was tiny. And we outgrew it and built a building. And I was working on the building and going to school, going to seminary and, and preaching and visiting and doing all this stuff. And I, I had sort of an emotional breakdown. I got all terrified and talk about overwhelmed with anxiety. And, uh, and I was in bed resting because that's what, that was the answer to that. Stop doing all that stuff. I, in fact, I was pray some of you heard this, I was in an all-night prayer meeting on top of everything else. I wasn't sleeping. And I was just asking for it. I thought I was Superman or something. So, so here I am laying in bed, and my dad, who has, I don't think my dad ever had a day of anxiety in his life. I'll tell you, he had a lot of reasons to have anxiety, but he, he just could blow things off. He came in, he said, Juni, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know, Dad, I just got these awful feelings of despair and all and this and that. And it's, uh, they tell me it's from, you know, total exhaustion and this and that. And the other. He said, what's the matter with you? Come on, what, what else? You, you, yeah, you've got a beautiful family, you've got a nice church. What's the matter with you? I mean, he could not identify. He just couldn't identify. And, and, and that's about what it would be like now here if this was all the verse we had. If we only had those first four words, in nothing be anxious. Well, how about the how to? The how to, well here's the how to. But in everything, everything, every experience, every pressure, every problem, everything, even good things, in everything, by prayer and supplication, Supplication means don't be afraid to cry out to God, to really call upon him, not just rattle through some prayer like I'm cool, but to really cry out to God. That only usually happens to a Christian when they come into a need where they're desperate. And sometimes that's why God's got to let us get into those places so we'll learn to pray and learn to get power in prayer because it's the crying out to God that he set it up that way. And so he says, supplication, and then he throws this in, 
with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. It's so important. With thanksgiving. That's praising God. That's worshiping God. That's adoring Him, thinking of all His greatness and works and, and acts of power and all the gracious good things He does. That, that's what it means when it says thanksgiving. It's not just thank you, it's praising God. And then He says, let your requests, specific, you got a problem, you got a need, let your requests be made known unto God. And then He says the result, if you can do this, and you can learn to do this and keep doing it. He says, the peace of God, not human peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, not as the world give I unto you, my peace I give unto you. So there's a special peace from God that surpasses understanding, as it says right here. So guard your hearts and minds through Christ. That means he'll keep you from more fear, more anxiety, and so forth. When we talk about the Lord's Prayer, our Lord Jesus warned us about praying in public and putting on a show. I've, I've never seen that done here. Um, I've seen it in the past here and there. I've seen uh, D.L. Moody tells a story of uh, when he was having a great crusade, he was a great evangelist in the last century, and he was having this great crusade, and, and uh, he, the habit was to get all the churches to cooperate. So uh, one of the pastors of one of the churches said, well, I'd like to lead in prayer. So Moody said, okay. So they started the service, they sang a few songs, they got Reverend Hoosey up there to lead in prayer, and he started praying. And he went on and on and on and on. And, and Moody finally got up and said, now let's just turn to hymn number 25 and sing until our brother gets done. <laughs> he just, uh, that took a lot of nerve. But uh, there are people who pray just to be heard. And the Pharisees were famous for this. And Jesus is directing us away from that kind of praying to true prayer, to real prayer. Now, one thing you have to know is that if we're going to pray effectively and get answers, and the most beautiful thing about prayer is we say prayer changes things. Well, what happens is prayer changes us. Prayer changes us. You cannot pray right in the presence of the Lord and not be edified and blessed and strengthened. It just can't happen. It's like if you're starving and you eat a meal, you're going to be full. <laughs> That's it. So. He, what's the enemy of, of real praying? The first enemy is hurry. Hurry. I'm in a hurry. I'm getting dressed. I'm praying as I go. Well, that's better than nothing, I guess. Uh, pray while you're driving. Well, sometimes we need to. <laughs> but, but prayer, he said, Jesus said in the previous verse, get in your closet, shut the door, and talk to your Father. That means you give him your full attention, that means you're giving time, time, total attention. God gives you his total attention. Would you believe that the Creator God is really concerned about every single individual? Jesus said the hairs of your head are all numbered. He sees a sparrow that falls, you're worth many sparrows. So the beauty of it is, that God gives us his full attention every moment. That's what our God's about. He's our Father in heaven, our perfect Father. So what do we do? You know, a lot of times kids get so busy they don't have time for their parents. Some kids don't respect their parents. Unfortunately, some parents don't deserve respect. That's a sad thing. But there's all those problems in the world where people don't have respect. Well, we need to respect God. That's a weak word compared to God, but, but we need to at least respect him by giving him time and full attention. Hurry is the death of time. I've had, I have to say, if I could figure it out, I think 90%, maybe 95% of my problems when I mess something up is because I'm in a hurry. Always in a hurry. And, and uh, you've got to learn and I'll tell you, if you learn to 
wait on the Lord, which means take your time in his presence. It'll help you wait and be slow down in other things. It just works that way. Our Lord Jesus was never in a hurry. Read the four Gospels, never in a hurry. They harried him, they hunted him, they chased him, they tried to kill him, all kinds of crazy stuff, and he never was in a hurry. Why? Because he was in total trust of the Father, and he just did what he had to do. The place of, of hurry never belongs in the place of prayer. Um, actually, we reveal uh, how we value our time with God by whether we give him our full attention and take our time and take time. Now, if you take time, you take it. You have to take it from something else. And we've got a thousand things, important things, but prayer is all vital, all vital, totally vital. And we need to put that first. As a believer, you've, and, and, and in this time, it's, it's like the, one of the toughest challenges there is for us to find time to go in the closet, shut the door, relax, and just talk to the Lord in no hurry. You, just, you go to him, and, and that's what this prayer is about, how to do that. But you've got to start by giving him time. So we prioritize about everything. We only have so much time, we have so much to do, we have to have priorities. This is first, this is second, this is third. Sometimes we're not that organized, but in our minds we do the things that we have to do first. Where does prayer fit in? I'm telling you, Christian, you need to take time to pray. There's a hymn, I should have put it in there, take time to be holy, take time. And so we reveal how we value or don't value our time with God by whether we take our time in his presence. And um, so the Lord told us to enter the closet, shut the door, and just relax, relax. He said, oh, that's hard to do. No, not if you really get into the presence of the Lord. Okay, um, let's see. In this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, the first thing that he gives us is he teaches us to whom to pray. That makes sense. To whom to pray. You say, well, naturally we know. No, a lot of people in the world don't know to whom to pray. <laughs> they, 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 they pray to all kinds of things and gods and the universe and this and that. I've heard people say, give it to the universe, give it to the universe as if the universe has some power, you know, it's crazy stuff. No, we have a personal God who's real. He's a person, he made us in his image like persons. He's an individual, believe it or not, with all that infinite power and glory and, and, and uh, wisdom and uh, infinite intellect and all that he is and beyond understanding, he's a person. And he comes to us as a person. He proved that by coming in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He actually took on human flesh to show us he's a person like us. So we can have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. Fear keeps us from that. Guilt, feelings of failure, I'm not good enough. That's where you've got to get hold of the truth of what he's like. He is a gracious, loving God who cares only for your good. He's our perfect Father in heaven. So the Lord Jesus tells us to whom to pray. We don't pray to saints. We don't pray to angels because they don't know anything about us. <laughs> that's, a, that's a superstition. You don't pray to saints. You don't pray to angels. You don't pray to your ancestors. It's ridiculous. Uh, and, and they don't they don't deserve the honor of prayer. I don't care how good they were. Uh, and they don't have the power to answer your prayers. So we, we Jesus focuses, he says, pray our Father, which art in heaven. And, and uh, of course, that Father has become known to us through Christ. So we can pray to Jesus, 
Oh, I talk to Jesus all day long because the Father is in Christ and they're one and I, and I just talk to Jesus. And uh, I, so, uh, it's the way to do it. It's, it's a way to live. And uh, so uh, we're taught not only to whom to pray, but we're taught how we should address our perfect Father. How should we approach Him? How should we address Him? And uh, um, uh, what, what title should we give Him uh, as we pray? And you say, oh, uh, well, you, you need to know these things. And um, the title is based on two things. First of all, when we look to God, the Creator, we're to realize that He is magnificent. Magnificent. And that's a weak word for God because God is so much more than that. But our, that's one of the greatest, biggest, strongest words we use for somebody. And some of the kings called themselves the magnificent as if they were the highest next to God Himself. Well, God is magnificent. Magnificent means great, infinitely powerful, highly exalted, overwhelmingly impressive to the mind and spirit. That's a big word, a big concept. And for people to take it to themselves is egomania. God alone is magnificent. He's magnificent, he's exalted, he's highly exalted. So he's magnificent. And, and that's good because that shows us he has all the power that we need to get our prayers answered. So not only is he magnificent, but there's another word that rhymes with magnificent, and it's beneficent. And that's the important part. Jesus is telling us that God is beneficent. And beneficent means gracious, kind, wanting to do good, showing love. That's what it means to be beneficent. So God is magnificent, but he's also beneficent. So he comes to us offering us help in time of need as a perfect father. He is beneficent. That's why we take the word Abba, which Jesus used in the garden of Gethsemane. It's, he used it always, but he, it, it was spelled out in the garden, Abba, Father. And it means like a little child saying, my father, my own father. And of course, they excoriated Christ for claiming God was his own father. Well, guess what? Since Jesus came, cleanses us in the blood, washes us clean, justifies us, gives us total forgiveness, and we stand perfect in his sight by his grace, we can say, he's my father. He's your father. But the Lord Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father, because he wants us to include others. He wants us all to come together, Our Father. But still, we can say, He's Abba, my Father. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, uh, the Lord Jesus, or not the Lord Jesus, Paul, of course, Romans 8, 15, Paul says, For ye have not received a spirit of bondage, again to fear. What, what is that? Well, that's what the world has. The world has a spirit of bondage. People are enslaved to themselves, to their own desires, to the values of the world. They're enslaved. They, they just, that's all they know. They think they're, that's the best thing for them. It's like slavery. Paul said that we should, we should never um, uh, speak evil of anyone because we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, and, uh, and, and uh, f under bondage, enslaved to lust. That's, that's the way it is before you're a Christian. You say, well, I'm not that bad. Well, you might not be, but you're not good enough without the blood of Christ. So again, to fear, ye have received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of adoption. That is the Spirit that's going to lead you to be adopted in heaven someday. And then he says, therefore, we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. You're my Father. You're my own Father. In Galatians, uh, Paul says this, and because you are sons of God, 
daughters of God, he hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. What he's saying is, if you really know the Lord, it's natural to pray to God as your father, aware that he is and wants to be your perfect father. So um, that's, that's so important. So we're taught uh, who to pray to, uh, who not to pray to, and uh, how to address ourselves to God, what title to give him, magnificent and beneficent, okay? Now, so the preface of the prayer is our Father which art in heaven. That's like the beginning, that's the first line, that's the opening uh, salvo as you come into God's presence. Our Father which art in heaven. Oh, I love that. We have a Father in heaven, in eternity. Our Father who art in heaven. So before we come with our petitions, and in the Lord's Prayer there are uh, four, four, three, four, five, six, seven petitions. We'll be looking at those later, but there are seven specific things that we're told to ask for. Um, and we'll see that. But before we come with our petitions, um, we're supposed to come to him uh, in, in a solemn address. In other words, we, we don't just jump in saying, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need that, I need that. No. First comes worship. Worship. When we come into the presence of the Holy God, we should bow before him and worship him. In this prayer, one great commentator said, it has much in little, and it is absolutely vital that we grasp and appreciate the sense and meaning of it. Why? It is only acceptable to be prayed. We can only pray this acceptable to God when it is offered with a measure of understanding and not vain repetition, which is the bane of this prayer. As I said yet last week, millions of people, millions of times today will be rattling through this prayer and have no clue what they're saying. They know, they know it's about God, it's about asking, you know, lead us not into temptation, uh, forgive us our trespasses, blah, blah, blah. But to, to really sense it, feel it, know it's real, that's, that's where the power is. So we address him to whom our requests are going to be made. But we, request, we, 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 we address him with this in mind. This prayer tells us we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus said that. That was his promise. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So we seek his righteousness. We seek his glory. We seek his kingdom. And then we can go with our requests and the other things can be added. Then it says, Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now we're gonna talk a little more about heaven, but first we wanna look at this phrase, hallowed. The word hallowed comes from a Greek word. It doesn't mean anything probably to most of us, but it's uh, hagiitsa. Uh, and it, it, it means holy, utterly holy, totally sanctified, set apart, uh, holy. And, and so we come to a God who is holy, 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 the Bible says. Three times, triple holy, perfect holiness. That means separate and apart from anything that would defile us. Holy, holy, holy. So, but we use the word uh, hallowed for holy. Hallowed be thy name. So what we're doing is acknowledging that our God is pure, perfect, holy, and hallowed to be respected and worshiped and bowed before and exalted in our minds and hearts. And um, so we are to begin by giving glory to God because he is due all glory. 
and, and, and it's not a petition at first. We, we get the petitions later, but it's adoration. We come getting our hearts in a, in a sense of his greatness. And that's where the word comes in. When you read the Psalms and you read the word of God and you read about Jesus, you see the greatness of God. And yet we have access with confidence. We come boldly to the throne of grace. So God's holiness uh, is, is to be magnified and glorified. Uh, his holiness is the greatness and glory of his perfections. That's what God is and that's the one to whom we come. So we begin by praising God. And uh, so first we worship and give him glory and praise. Okay, we're gonna end uh, there and uh, continue uh, ne next couple, couple weeks on this subject. So let's pray together. Father, we do want to know how to pray, how to pray effectively, how to pray in a way that is pleasing to you, that honors you, and above all, that brings about answers and results and blessing and power, not only upon us, but upon those we care about. So we ask you, Lord, to Jesus, as the disciples said, teach us to pray, not just how to pray, but to pray with all our hearts. We ask that for each one here today and everyone who hears this message in Jesus name. Amen. With the sound of the strings, symbols and heart, we praise you.